uh, the nature of uh, these, these sorts of uh, relationships. So here we have uh, advocates in 1861. Can we look at advocates in 1911 now? I think you'd agree they're pretty much the same. There's not really much change here. Um, perhaps one or two slight changes, but nothing much. Now let's do the same with the solicitors in 1861 and 1911. So here we have 1861 and here's 1911. So I think you see here that the, can you just do that again, the, put the 1861 on first. Can you, can you take the, uh, the other one off? Yeah. So here's 1861. Now we have, uh, where are they in 1911? And they've moved. They've moved here. Here they are in the new town, uh, particularly in this part between Princess Street and Queen Street. There's a cluster around the West End. There's a change taking place here. If you look at the green markers for 1861, there's a drift into this. So there's no change in the location of the advocates, but there's definitely a change in the way the solicitors are distributed. So for me and for my students, I'm saying, why? Why is this the case? What are the, what are the ideas that one might have about this change? What's happening to the solicitors? Why should this occur? Now, I don't know. I really don't know. But I do think that what's likely to have happened is that as the degradation of Princess Street and this area here has progressed in the late 19th century. As the elite addresses have become less than elite and the middle classes have moved out here and into Morningside and Merkiston and so forth, these properties have been made available. And I also think, my hunch, is that the businesses, the solicitors' businesses, can be less handled by an individual managing the entire work of a solicitor's office and having to specialize increasingly with marriages, wills, trusts, and so on and so forth in the legal business. So they have, you know, we have these triple-barreled solicitor's names emerging in this area. I don't know. I throw it out as a, as a way in which the kind of spatial analysis that we've been doing suggests lines, avenues of exploration, which I think are potentially rich. And my suggestions may be completely rubbish about advocates and solicitors. It's just a hunch. I haven't done any research about it. So here is an example which I believe will advance local historical scholarship. It will deepen and, uh, it and it will encourage local historians to ask these and answer these kinds of questions. So now we'll just go to a different kind of approach which we've been developing, not just to do with addresses, but with areas, with particular parts of the city which have characteristics. Now, one of the things that Chris didn't say that I'd been doing was I've been interested in the colonies. And some years ago, you may remember, those of you who have long memories, that there was an exhibition on the colonies uh, in the City Arts Centre, which I was involved with. And there'll be a reprint of the book in the new, new, near future. Now, here are the colonies. You know, people say in Edinburgh that we don't know what, why they're called colonies. It's, it's blindingly obvious. They're all actually right on the fringe at the moment in, uh, of which they're built. They're all in green fields, and the cooperators complained bitterly that they were forced into the fields to get uh, cheap uh, land. So here are the colonies. And one of the things that I think is interesting is the composition, the occupational composition of the colonists. Where are the building trades, which were supposed to be the essence of these cooperators in the 1860s. So here, in Glenogle Park, this is a polygon that lies behind this. 
with information about a database with various bits of information about the colonies. So 23.4% of the households employed in the building trades in, in uh, Stockbridge. So pick another one. So now we're in Dalry, 27.8. So a quarter of them, this is data from 1871. They've only been going 10 years. Uh, and the first um, uh, occupants are not significantly different. So a quarter of the aspiration of the colonists to have this as something for building trades workers is only being a quarter realized. What about the Clarks? Here in Shaftesbury Park, Shandon, uh, much later development, uh, about 28% of them, uh, uh, sorry, 15% of the households in Shaftesbury Park, Shandon, uh, are Clarks. And we can go around again, so there's a database lying behind these areas drawn on the maps. And we can go around here and get different ideas uh, based on other pieces of research. Research. So it's just a different way of representing that data. Some people, like me, think spatially. Some people don't. Beneath this are the calculations in pie charts, which eventually will have percentages on them, I'm sure. And we can quickly move to these polygons, to these sites, to get an idea of the distribution of particular trades, whether they're government employees, shopkeepers, the retired annuitants, and so forth. So that's another, another aspect of doing this. OK, that's something about the colonies. Now, there's a story here. James Colville was the manager of the Edinburgh Cooperative Building Company. He's commemorated in various places around the city with a nice plaque that says <coughs> that he was the manager. The man lived at 32 Bell Place in Stockbridge, and he customarily, three or four times a week, walked to those colonies to see how the building sites were doing. He walked first to Wrestlerig uh, to see what was happening there at uh, what was then called Hermitage Park. He then walked to Abbey Hill because there, there were the Norton Place colonies. He then walked to Dalry, these are the three earliest sites, and finally, poor man, he walked home to Bell Place in Stockbridge. So here's his route. Well, it just gone cross country here. <laughs> it's the commando James Colville, and so we're tracing his route here as another little tool, uh, taking us to. We're, we're aiming here. Yeah. For goodness sake, give him a quick route home. <laughs> and there he gets home. Well done. 12.19 kilometers. Okay, he's done eight miles today. And he does it on two, three, three or four occasions a week. So here's the, to here's the tool. It shows us how far he's gone and what he's had to confront climbing the hills of, of Edinburgh. Now, you might think this is all very trite, and it maybe is. But he also said to his uh, board, I'd like a horse and trap. Can I please have a pony and trap? I'm getting old. So that's exactly what happened. After a lot of argument, James Colville got his pony and trap and saved himself a bit of shoe leather in the course of, the, of, course of doing that. Now, the serious point is that we can look at cemeteries or we can test the idea put up by a very, very nice man and, and a very good economic historian, John Kellett, when he said that up to 9% of British cities were occupied in 1914 by railway companies of the land area. So we could take that and um, go to the Haymarket site, track out how much of the railway line either side is given over to the railway company using historical maps. We could tell the developers that uh, Morrison Street, in fact, always was a goods yard and so it should remain, and so on and so forth. So here's a tool which would be very useful for us to get a sense of both the space of something and the distance. 
as somebody who's worked out not just the polygons of land ownership, but then tried to apply my higher, my, no, my O grade arithmetic calculations about how you do square measure, breaking up an area into several different components of triangles and rectangles. This is brilliant. It's just wonderful to be able to get a sense of what the land use or other purposes, green space or whatever it is, can be used. So this is one of the tools that we're developing within the project. And finally, but perhaps most importantly, we're also working very hard to develop the boundaries of Edinburgh and have these identified as such. And Daniel, who's hiding at the back here, has been doing most of the, the hard work on this. Crucially, the city changed, of course, extending its boundaries on a frequent basis. So when we have information in the census or in other resources which refers to districts or wards or sanitary districts as we get in other sources, when we have information about households or the age distribution by ward or registration district, we need to know where these boundaries are to be able to plot this. So this is what we've been doing. Here you have the, male, the female to male ratio in 1861. Yellow shows the least of the, the ratio, 1.09. This is almost a one-to-one -one ratio of men to, to women in this part of Edinburgh. Um, in 1861. And the darker, I think it's all pretty dark, the darker it is, the higher the ratio. So there's a higher ratio of females in this part of Edinburgh, the north side of Edinburgh, compared to anywhere else. Stuart's put it in three dimensions as well, which is something else that we're trying to, to work on to show the three-dimensional nature of the city. Its verticality is a feature as much as uh, its uh, social structure and social distribution. So by working on these different boundaries, and we have outlays for, well, all of the, nearly all of the 19th century down to 1914 for the boundary changes, and we have information about different kinds of household heads, male to female ratio, ward data, these are, if you like, containers which, this is where the crowdsourcing comes in for us, the local historian can then say, well, actually, I've got some information on the amount of refuse collected in the sanitary districts, the 19 sanitary districts of Edinburgh, and I'd like to know where most of the refuse came from. Let's see where this, this is, and we can put this in this kind of spatial distribution and map it and publish it or, and do whatever we want with it. So this business of developing the boundaries of Edinburgh in the 19th century and down to 1914 is amazingly complicated. And here is that 3D representation. This is, this is Chris's favorite, um, which shows a 3D representation and it's change over time based on a map from 1919, which is also automated. It sort of creeps across the page as uh, the years go by. So this is the sort of thing which in the Visualizing Urban, History, Urban Geographies project we've been trying to do. It builds a little bit on what's happening in addressing history, but it goes, I think, a lot further particularly a lot further into the community, into public history, in its utility and its ultimate simplicity. And so we'd like to thank all our partners in, in this project, not least, of course, the Research Council, who pays for the only full-time person, Stuart, who's done most of the work. Thank you.